right, I'll get this started. Hello, everyone. My name is Tiashan Rogier. I'm the CEO of Namebase, and we are building a domain registrar for the Handshake blockchain. Uh, I'm not really going to talk too much about Namebase today, though. I'm going to be talking more about Handshake and explaining the security benefits of Handshake as a protocol. And just by a show of hands, can everyone raise their hand if they've heard of Handshake before? So about like half the room. Cool. Um, I'll give a brief intro, and then I'll dig into a few certain aspects of Handshake. So at a high level, Handshake is a protocol for decentralized naming. It is built in a way that's actually very similar to Bitcoin. It's a proof of work based chain. Uh, but it's a little bit different in that instead of using your coins as money, use the coins to register names on the Handshake blockchain. And these names are actually top level domain names. Let me just make sure that works. Okay, there we go. These names are actually top level domain names. And the special thing about these TLDs, which are, you know, like .com, .org, .net, et cetera, is that they're very difficult to censor and seize. Uh, by nature of being stored on the blockchain, they have those properties. But then the other property that's really important about handshake names is that they can actually make the internet more secure. And that's actually what I'm going to be digging into more today, is how does handshake actually make the internet more secure. Because I think you know, everyone in crypto, we kind of get the idea behind censorship resistance and seizure resistance. Uh, it's a really important benefit. The security benefit, though, it's a little bit more specific. Um, and it's a little bit more nuanced in terms of understanding it. So let's dig into that. To first understand how Handshake can improve the security of the internet, I'm going to explain how the internet requests will normally work in today's world, starting with HTTP. HTTP is the backbone of the internet. If you've ever typed in HTTP colon slash slash google.com, then you've used the HTTP protocol. And the way it works is that when you type in that URL, HTTP google.com, your browser will first do a DNS lookup and find the IP address of Google servers. An IP address looks something like 192.168.x.x. And what your browser will do is it'll then initiate an HTTP request to Google server. And that request is actually routed from your browser all the way to Google server, which is you know, probably in California or all around the world. And along the way, it's traveling through a series of interconnected networks. All these interconnected networks will tie together and help you route your request to any server that you want to go to. Now, the interesting thing about this is that sometimes these requests will go through a different country, even if your request is going to another server in the same country as you. For example, if you're in South America, pretty much all of your traffic is being routed through a network center in Miami, actually. So even if you're making a request to another website in Brazil, your traffic is actually going to go all the way to Miami and then come back down to South America. Now, this poses a big problem for security. It poses a problem known as a man-in-the-middle attack. This is when one of the intermediate networks uh, in between you and the server spies on your traffic or reroutes the traffic or even tampers with the traffic. And this is a problem that plagued HTTP. Uh, when you're just using pure HTTP, your traffic is incredibly vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. It's just super easy. There are even examples of uh, there's this app that would let you go into a Starbucks, and basically it was a Chrome extension, and it would basically let you see everyone's Facebook passwords and whatever passwords, because it was so easy to do this man-in-the-middle attack. And so you know, internet security researchers are pretty smart, so they came up with a solution to this, HTTPS. Oh, let me just. There we go. Solution, HTTPS. HTTPS provides authentication, integrity, and encryption to HTTP. The way it works is that it adds a single technology called TLS, which is transport layer security. And effectively what it does is it encrypts your HTTP traffic. The way that it does this is it uses public-private key cryptography. 
essentially what Google.com will do with HTTPS is they'll have a public key, a certificate, that they say represents them. When you make a request to Google, Google will return that certificate to you, and you use it to encrypt your traffic to Google. Now, any intermediate who's spying on your traffic won't be able to decrypt your traffic. Only Google can, because only Google has the private key for their certificate. This also means that if your traffic is routed to another server, they won't be able to respond because they won't be able to decrypt the uh, traffic and respond to you. But there's a really critical assumption here. How do you know that Google certificate is actually Google certificate? If a man in the middle attacker was sitting in front of you in Google and they responded with a fake certificate, your, tra your traffic would still be compromised and you, don't, you wouldn't even know it. And that's normally what would happen, except security researchers, they you know, were able to plan ahead, and so they came up with a solution. And that solution lets your browser know when a certificate is invalid. And that's why if you try to go to a website that has a bad certificate, it'll actually show this error so that you know it's a big, scary website and you shouldn't visit it. And that solution that they came up with are certificate authorities. CAs are effectively third parties that you trust to verify that the certificates that you're receiving from websites are accurate. Basically what happens is that Google.com will register their certificate with a certificate authority. And then when you make that request and you get it back, you're able to then check with that certificate authority that they registered with and verify that that is the correct certificate. So this is what it looks like. If you go into your browser, if you go to google.com, and you click on that little lock icon uh, in the URL bar, you'll be able to see Google certificate. It's global sign. And so what your computer does is it actually ships with a list of trusted certificate authorities. And re Google registered one of their certificates with one of those certificate authorities. That way, when you make the request, you're able to verify it. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of certificate authorities that are installed by default on your computer. And if you're in crypto, you can probably see what the next vulnerability is. The certificate authorities themselves, the trusted third parties. It's a big security vulnerability in the way that the internet works today. By default, your computer ships with hundreds of certificate authorities right on your machine. If you go into your uh, keychain access, you can go into your settings, you can see that list of uh, certificate authorities that are installed. I bought my MacBook in California, and even then I have a certificate authority that's um, the Hong Kong International Certificate Authority, which is you know, a Hong Kong-based firm. So even in America, you kind of get these you know, sketchy-looking actors, but it's even worse than that. CAs are able to delegate trust to any number of intermediates, and those intermediates can delegate trust to any number of their own intermediates all the way down. The way that the CA system works is that if any one of those intermediates or CAs gets compromised, your internet traffic is effectively compromised. This is a vulnerability that can and does happen. Uh, it's exploited by nation states. There is a famous uh, digital not notar attack where Iran uh, basically attached this uh, specific CA and they were able to hack into it uh, and compromise traffic for a bunch of their citizens. Uh, and then some other uh, governments will try to do something more direct. Most recently, the Kazakhstan government tried to get their citizens to install a root government CA onto all their computers. And, and basically what this would do would just completely destroy the point of having uh, a CA in the first place, because now the government would be able to view all their traffic. And Mozilla actually caught that early, and they were able to prevent that. But any of the existing CAs and intermediates that are on your computer are already trusted by default, and they have pretty atrocious, uh, atrocious security practices. Um, so they end up actually getting compromised all the time, and it's, it's really surprising how bad they can be. So we have a fix for this. We have a new technology that can let you fix this trusted third party. It's a blockchain. Specifically, what you can do is that you can put a certificate directly on the blockchain. So what you do is you shift the root of trust from the CA-based base system, which is a collection of random third parties, to the blockchain, which, even though it's slow and can be difficult to use, is really good at trust minimization. Right? It's probably the best system that we have today with the current technology of minimizing trust. And that's exactly what Handshake aims to do. Handshake lets you register names on the blockchain. And these names are specifically top-level domain names like .org and .com and .net. 
Basically, you can register new TLDs, uh, not the existing TLDs. Those are blacklisted for backwards compatibility. But you can register new TLDs. And the great thing is that you can associate any arbitrary data with those TLDs. The benefit of that is that arbitrary data can be your certificate itself. You can pin your certificate to your name so that anyone who's requesting traffic to that name is going to be able to check this is the right certificate authority. And they can verify with the blockchain that that's correct. Now you don't have a trusted third party that's the certificate authority in the middle that you have to trust. And there are other benefits to this. Only the private key holder of that name is going to be able to edit and modify that name. That's really important because in today's world, people always talk about buying domain names. You know, who here has bought a domain name? Raise your hand. A good number of you. You don't actually own your domain name. What you're effectively doing is leasing your domain name from these registrars, and it's pretty much imp impossible to truly own a domain name. Even the TLDs themselves are not owned by the TLD owners. They're effectively leasing it from uh, ICANN, and they can have it taken away. And so you never really own it. But with Handshake, if you own the private key to your name, only you own the name. You truly own a piece of the internet. And there are significant benefits to that. Not only does Handshake help improve the security of the internet by removing the need for CAs, but you as a domain owner also now own the internet, and you're able to prevent censorship and seizure and tampering, unless you get your private key stolen. But there are many mechanisms to prevent against that. So Handshake is a much better route of trust than the current CAs. Now, how do you use Handshake? Well, importantly, using Handshake is exactly the same as using any other DNS resolver. In this example, I pointed my phone to a uh, Handshake Resolver, and then I was able to visit Namebase Slash directly in iOS Safari and resolve it through my browser. And you'll notice an interesting point there. I'm actually using the TLD itself as a domain name. It's like the equivalent of using com, .com as a domain name and visiting that. Now, with Handshake, you can still point it to a name server and have subdomains, right? You could have homepage.namebase, wallet.namebase, buy.namebase, or I could have registered .base and then had someone go to name.base. But you can also use the TLD itself, uh, which is just an interesting behavior. And critically, as a consumer, the way that you use Handshake is no different than how you would use any other resolver. There are existing resolvers on the market, uh, namely Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 and Google's 8.8.8.8. And they already have tens of millions of users. Uh, it's estimated that between Cloudflare and Google, their resolvers run about 15% of the world's traffic. And importantly, the way that you use these resolvers is not by having it installed by default on your machine, which is what normally happens with resolvers, but to actually use Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1, you need to explicitly go into your computer settings, change the settings to point to Cloudflare's resolver, and then you're off to the races. And that's something that tens of millions of people have already done, and that's the same way that you use Handshake. To use Handshake, you just go into your computer settings point, or your phone settings, point your resolver to a Handshake resolver, and then everything else works as normal. All your .com and .net and .org TLDs will resolve as it should, but you'll also get access to all the Handshake TLDs, which are censorship resistant and seizure resistant. And that's really important because otherwise, you know, we know that in crypto, typically you have to trade off you know, security or decentralization for usability. But in Handshake's case, just because of the way that the internet works, you don't actually have to trade off uh, much of anything in order to provide a good user experience. The other really critical thing is that Handshake is the only naming chain with a light client recursive DNS resolver. Uh, this is very specific to the way that DNS works, but effectively, Handshake has a client that only needs 10 megabytes of memory to run and virtually zero CPU, and it can trustlessly resolve these names. That's really important because without the light client, the way that you would normally have a fully trusted solution without even relying on a third-party resolver is you'd have to run a full node on your own. That's uh, fine, but you know, we kind of know in this space that full nodes are not something that everyone runs. Consumers in general just don't run full nodes. They're big, bulky pieces of software, and it takes a lot of commitment. You're not going to have your average consumer installing these. But with a light client, it basically drastically increases the surface area of where you can install Handshake and have uh, provide a trustless experience. The light client can be embedded within browsers or wallets or apps. It can even be put into embedded devices. And so consumers downloading one of these pieces of software can be using Handshake trustlessly without having to go through any explicit steps. So why does this matter? Well, 
in today's world, we're seeing that the internet is becoming more censored, not less. When we started working on this uh, about a year and a half ago, it was pretty much like every other month or so that we would see some piece of critical news about some hack or some area of censorship happening. But now it's pretty much every week or even every other day where we're seeing some pervasive censorship occurring. A few months ago, the Kazakhstan government tried to install a, a, you know, a certificate on all their citizens. Um, a few weeks ago, the Iranian government censored uh, Twitter.com and Facebook.com uh, before just shutting off the internet completely. Uh, and then obviously what's happening in China with Hong Kong and just in China generally is something that's you know, occurring every day. And that's not only touching Hong Kong, it's even touching American companies, you know, namely the famous example of the NBA being censored by China because of that one tweet that someone made. And that's really critical. It's a, obviously a bad thing that's happening, but it's also kind of good for all this you know, censorship tech that everyone here is trying to build because now this problem of censorship is invading the mainstream consciousness. We're seeing that it's becoming more and more important to people that they have technology that helps them resist this. And this is a critical time because now we're starting to see that it is not at all the case that with 100% probability, you know, the internet 10 years from now is going to be safe and better. Uh, it's a pretty much a battle at this point, and in 10 years from now, it's a very real possibility that the internet that we have is less secure, less free, and less safe. Unless we have technologies like Handshake and other uh, projects that can help fight against that. And so that's why it's important. Now, in order to get us to that vision, it's going to take a lot of work. Thankfully for the end user, for the consumer, they still have the same experience as they normally would, right? Just point it to the resolver and you're done. But for a name owner, it's still pretty difficult. Uh, you know, you have to go through this whole process. You have to go and go into the CLI, register a bunch of names. It takes two weeks. You have to submit a lot of transactions. It's a pretty technical process that's easy to mess up. And so that's what Namebase does. We're basically just trying to protect the security of the internet by giving an unstoppable name to everyone in the world. And the goal is to make that as easy as possible for domain owners so that they can just come onto a website, register their name, and be off to the races. So that's our specific mission within Handshake. And then the goal for Handshake is to basically just provide a better internet, a naming system that the entire world can rely on. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as an end user, and I, I, I say, OK, my bank is Chase. I want to use Chase. How, how do I know that uh, the domain Chase is owned by my bank? How, how do I know who really ah. Yeah, great question. So first of all, all the existing domains are uh, already on Handshake and blacklisted. So for example, like if Chase owns Chase.com, which I think they do, then you would still be able to go to Chase.com, and that works as normal. If Chase were to register a Handshake name, well, that's not really interesting. So actually, only Chase.com can register .chase on Handshake right now. Because what Handshake has done is they were really uh, considerate about uh, backwards compatibility and transitioning. And so they took the Alexa top 100,000 domain names, and they made it so that only those domains can claim the top level domain on Handshake. Uh, basically, they use a technology called DNSSEC, which is basically like a, you can imagine it's like a public key that's associated with that name. Uh, and they created a method where only the owners of the private key for that public key are able to claim that name. So for the sunset period of Handshake, which is about four years, only chase.com can claim .chase. So you're kind of bootstrapping on the existing system. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's something that I think is really important because there have been a lot of, Handshake is what is known as an alternative DNS route, and there have been a lot of attempts in the past at alternative DNS routes. Uh, and if you're interested in this, I'm happy to talk more about why I think Handshake is different. Namely, it actually provides significant benefits to the existing system versus just having more names. Uh, but something that's really important is that you know, we, we have path dependency. Everyone's already on the existing DNS system, so we can't just create a separate system in parallel and expect everyone to switch over. Um, so with Handshake, a lot of the work that's gone into it is actually making sure that it's backwards compatible with the existing system so that there can be a transition. Um, you know, if you've been in the space, you're probably familiar with like, other projects in the past that have been attempts at naming. Um, but the challenge is that you know, while it's theoretically possible to have a better DNS system on a blockchain, it takes just a lot of engineering grunt work to actually make it work. And so that's where a lot of the fo focus has been on. Yep. What sort of naming conventions do you think uh, you're going to have uh, to, to, to know the um, uh, public key address versus you know, a website? So, you know, 
example, you've got fax numbers and you've got telephone numbers in the old days, mm -hmm. and they were the same, and you didn't know which was using the fax versus which was the telephone. Yeah, totally. So. The interesting thing with Handshake is that you, know, you can associate any arbitrary data with your name, right? So that can be a, you know, a phone number or a fax number or even a wallet address, uh, and that's totally fine. Um, specifically, when it comes to public keys, like uh, the certificate uh, that you're trying to pin for the uh, you know, HTTPS, um, that's a specific type of record. Uh, basically, you'd, you'd pin a TLSA cert, uh, and it's very recognizable, and it's something that's very specific to DNS. Um, and so that would, th that would, by default, you would just know that that's a TLS cert. If you were to associate any other arbitrary data, you would do it in uh, what's known as a text record. Um, and basically, the text records are used in DNS today to associate arbitrary data with domain names. Uh, and you basically just uh, want to specify what that data is. So maybe you would begin the record with you know, phone number equals wallet address equals, fax number equals, and so you, you would donate that yourself. Cool, all right, thank you.